Hello guys, can you hear me? Good evening. So we'll be starting about uh, today's discussion on one more Ames paper. Uh, this is probably the first paper which had lots of the multiple choice questions, match the following, true or false, and lots of them, right? This was one of the papers which was, which is the one which was bit uh, erratic, the six new patterns. After that, I don't know what Ames thought. Ames just cut it off and Ames didn't cut off the Ames exam as well. And in his it started, fine. So what you're going to see today is the, uh, the few questions, like may maybe we'll go it faster. We'll try to cover 15 questions maximum, fine in whatever came the aims exam i think aims number 2019 fine so again as usual the routine we have a plus subscription iconic subscription the limited period offer and i would request all of you try the midmind scholarship test and we'll be discussing the questions of the midmind scholarship scholarship test as well as in the special classes fine let's see it's all the pathology slides i'm sure all of you will excel the questions and the, those were very pretty easy ones right if you apply logic and if you read the questions and write I'm sure you will definitely get it correct, fine. And if you get it correct, the first prize, you get 100% scholarship, which is going to be useful for all of you guys, fine. And we have few plans, few batches. Apply whatever codes you want. And if you don't have any code, you can use Pathocups as well, fine. So now let's go to the first question. The first question is, which of the following is not a small brown blue cell tumor? See, this question is a very simple question. From a pathologist's point of view, because when I'm going to diagnose something, uh, especially when I when it comes to cancer, we always go with patterns, right? That I have discussed in plenty of times, and there are a few uh, images, a few videos in my uh, YouTube channel as well. Patterns of neoplasia. Right? Patterns is the one which is going to be helpful for diagnosis always, right? So small round blue cell are tumors which end in blastomas. Those are the main tumors which end blastoma. So unfortunately, I have all of them having to end blastoma, neuroblastoma, retinoblastoma, hemangioblastoma, and uh, three uh, tumors ending blastoma. And one Ewing sarcoma is again a small round blue cell tumor. And any embryonal carcinoma again a small round blue cell tumor. Fine. So I have few blastomas which will not have a small round blue cell tumor. One is one of them is hemangioblastoma. Right? There is one more blastoma which is glioblastoma. Fine. The two blastomas which are not small round blue cell tumor, one is glioblastoma. Uh, where does it happen? Yeah, almost all lymphomas will be like a small round blue cell tumor only. Yes. Glioblastoma happens in the brain. It's one of the most aggressive neoplasms that happens in the brain. Fine. That will not have a small round blue cell tumor. Glioblastoma has a pattern called as an your pseudopalisading pattern, right? Pseudopalisading necrosis and pseudopalisading pattern. Fine. That will not have a small round blue cell morphology. That's the first one. Yeah, cerebrum it happens. The second blastoma is going to be hemangioblastoma. See, hemangioblastoma, as the name says, hemangio, they have blood vessel rich neoplasms. First one. I'm going to have blood vessel rich neoplasms. And hemangioblastoma also has one characteristic finding called as staghorn appearing vessels. Right? Hemangioblastoma has something called as staghorn vessels. We have already read uh, Staghorn in multiple places in pathology. Staghorn calculi, what is that? Which of the following, which calculi is called as in Staghorn calculi? Staghorn calculi is perfect. Yes, true white stones are called as Staghorn calculi, right? So Staghorn appearance of vessels. Okay, yeah, perfect. Your antler horn of Staghorn is the FNAC finding for fibroadenoma as well, right? Staghorn vessel is characteristic clue for hemangioblastoma, fine. Right? Since we read hemangioblastoma, see hemangioblastoma as well as hemangiopericytoma. So the hemangiopericytoma will have staghorn vessels. Hemangioblastoma is going to be more predominantly of blood vessels and all those things. Sorry. Hemangiopericytoma will have staghorn vessels. I just wanted to discuss that as well. Okay. Fine. Hemangioblastoma is predominantly large vessels and lots of uh, spaces like a normal hemangioma but a little bit of immaturity will be there fine so these this is one blastoma which will not have a small down blue cell morphology fine as well as glioblastoma okay okay perfect that's the first question we'll move to the second one thankfully these type of questions is stopped in aims exam because see uh 
match the following can be very simple but true or false might be very difficult assertion assertion reasoning questions can be difficult as well right those six patterns thankfully they have stopped it when it's in match the following the easiest th easiest thing about match the following is if you know one or two of the match the following we can easily identify the rest of them fine here we have viral inclusions in one, one side and we have also the viruses in the other side and we have to match it so hpv see this all of us know how can you forget cmv right so we can never forget cmv so one will be for b and two will be for c with that itself i can easily identify if you know uh, coilo said you can crack this question one b is only in one option this is option a this is wrong 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 right that's more than enough for us fine right? hpv is coilocytic change which we know cmv is also inclusion molluscum contagiosum is your henderson peterson bodies right there's one more hp bodies which disease the other hp bodies will have so other other hp bodies will be seen in which disease you have something called as chlamydia right you have halbert starter provasic bodies right trachoma or your chlamydia fine that's also an hp body so don't confuse amongst them and polymorphs obviously the one which is left is your decoys cells okay so that's the correct answer so which will match with the option a 1 b 2 c c d and 3 d and 4 a right that should be 3 d and 4 a fine so coilocyte is a diagnostic clue when do i call it coilocyte again all of them are intracytoplasmic inclusions like so coilocyte is intracytoplasmic inclusion hp body is an intracytoplasmic inclusion outside and decoys cells are intranuclear inclusions fine coilocyte what will have is have both nuclear change as well as cytoplasmic change what will happen to nucleus is nucleus will be shrunken like a resinoid nucleus resin like nucleus okay and you'll have an almost a clear cytoplasm the cytoplasm is like someone said uh, about evo e5 right the cytoplasm is due to the accumulation of viral proteins allow a clear intracytoplasmic inclusion and a peripherally pushed resinoid resinoid is a resin will look very wrinkled right it looks like a resinoid looking as so that's a clue all of the finding should be there to call it a coilocyte not just the inclusions fine next is going to be a classical outside outside is in classical intranuclear basophilic inclusion fine basophilic is the important thing here it mean need not be always outside i have put an image in the telegram group as well it can be anything blue color intranuclear right that's all decoy is also intranuclear blue color it's also basophilic where do you see decoy cells where do you see decoy cells you see decoy cells in polymorphs right so to have decoy cells in your urine microscopy or in a renal biopsy you should have one thing for sure that should be your um, transplant patients is where we we see them always right so to have decoy cells decoy cells are seen first in urine cytology or in a renal biopsy generally is seen post transplant post transplant will be there almost always fine it will be there right and there polymorphs okay sv40 is a very very important marker see why uh, sv40 becomes important is post renal transplant i need to know what is the cause of uh, this must be coming out as rejection in the renal transplant right i need to know why a renal transplant is getting rejected fine more than 6 months maybe the common ones but i it can happen any point during the lifetime of the renal transplant so when they take a renal transplant or have a renal transplant and the, if there's a rejection they should take a biopsy i have to say due to an infectious causes or due to just due to rejection so it's a rejection i'm going to treat it different way a viral infection i'm going to treat it different way so sometimes it's very very difficult to pick up your decoy cells it will be very very tiny just a smudge nucleus so to prove it we have sv40 we have an ihc for sv40 if sv40 is positive ihc wise it will pick up even a very very rare nuclei which is normally picked uh, normally missed on a routine hne fine right? sv40 is important do remember this especially a person working on renal pathology and renal transplant settings will know sv40 very much and renal pathology's fellowship is one of the most uh, famous fellowship in pathology so you have to know about that as well fine okay 
Next one is your uh, Henderson Peterson bodies, right? HP bodies, or we just call it a molluscum bodies. We, it's just an intracytoplasmic inclusion, and they are eosinophilic. Skin involvement. If you have to talk about one virus, the virus is going to be molluscum contagioso. Uh, pox viruses are a bit rare. Other pox viruses are a bit rare, like your smallpox, chickenpox. All those viruses are a bit rare these days. So one virus molluscum is common and the clinical finding of molluscum is also the first clue to look for look for you will have a pearly white umbilicated nodules anywhere in the body the first thought is going to be molluscum contagiosum fine okay so that's about this is viral inclusions and this match the following fine this match the following very easy ones they took that away as well along with that we they took up the difficult part of the questions as well fine we'll go to the next question okay one more match the following Match the following translocations and its lymphomas. One side I have lymphomas, other side I am having translocations. Okay. So again, few things are more than enough for us to diagnose. So Burkitt's lymphoma. You have your 814 translocation. So I have to just look for which is 814. Okay, so two of them has one for B, right? So I'm going to for the second one. Follicular lymphoma is 1418 translocation, right? So again, both C and D option is 2 as D. Third, mantle cell lymphoma and marginal zone lymphoma, right? So mantle cell lymphoma has multiple things. One of the common ones in mantle cell lymphoma is translocation 1114, okay? And marginal zone lymphoma, sorry, mantle cell lymphoma is 1114. Marginal zone lymphoma has multiple things. And one of the commonest one is your 1118, fine? Marginal zone, you have translocation between 1118 Margin zone can have translocation with 318. Just discussed in the telegram group, someone asked for the question, right? You have lots of mutations in your margin zone lymphoma, and the common one is going to be your 1118 translocation. Especially when, when, you, when it comes to margin zone lymphoma, uh, the thing is the mutation will vary based on your uh, site of involvement. Like I might see 314 more common in Hashimoto's thyroiditis, right? You can have translocation. 114 as well there are few trisomies seen in marginal zone lymphoma as well okay there are few trisomies which can be seen in marginal zone lymphoma and marginal zone lymphoma or your maltoma right it's heterogeneous this being the commoner one because it is commonly seen in your git as well as in the stomach stomach maltomas and ga maltomas are much more common compared to the other areas right so these are the four translocations which can be seen in marginal zone lymphoma and bucket you know Apart from 814 translocation, Burkitt, the clue is the 8, right? You can have translocation 28 and translocation 822 between your kappa and lambda light chain, fine? And your mantle cell lymphoma translocation 1114, where the important one is your cyclin D1, which gets translocated. And you have your famous uh, follicular lymphoma, where your BCL2 gets translocated. The common denominator for all of them is chromosome 14. Chromosome 14 is one notorious thing which can get translocated often. The reason being the simple normal human physiology. What is there in chromosome 14? If you guys know, I'm sure you guys know that. The common thing with which your cyclin D1 or BCL2 or your uh, uh, CMIC in Burkitt's lymphoma gets translocated is your immunoglobulin heavy chain. IgH is the major problem here. In, in IgH, not everything. If you remember your immunoglobulin structure, you have something called as a uh, variable chain and constant chain. So this variable chain is a notorious one. So variable chain by birth, like by in normal C itself, they have something called as a uh, somatic hypermutation. There's something called as normally we have something called as somatic hypermutation, which keeps on happening routinely in a normal uh, person, right? Whenever I'm going to get exposed to an antigen, let's say a bacteria, Somatic hypermutation is very very common so that I can produce a specific antibody against the bacteria. So when normally I have mutations, there's more chance of this guy getting translocated or getting further mutated, which is pathologically mutated, right? So I have somatic hypermutation which is completely normal. So since there is like every day I have physiological mutations in a B cell to produce different types of antibodies. So there is more chance of having a pathological mutation. Okay, that's the reason your immunoglobulin heavy chain gets involved in most of the lymphomas, right? It's a common denominator for most of the lymphomas. 
You can see immunoglobin heavy chain myeloma, right? You can see them in CLL, right? The 14 uh, translocation is very common uh, with all the B cell, almost all the B cell lymphomas, right? So that's about this, your um, uh, match the following, fine? We'll go to the next one. Okay, which are the following translocations seen in Ewing sarcoma? See, the soft tissue neoplasms uh, translocation has become common for the uh, continuity for uh, two, three aims. The soft tissue neoplasms translocation was repeatedly asked. Uh, for the only reason that uh, off late, we have started using molecular uh, diagnostic methods for soft tissue neoplasms as well. And that's the reason it has been asked. Whenever it comes in practice, obviously I'm going to ask in your MCQs as well. If it's not there in practice, I'm not going to ask in your MCQ. So when it's come to soft tissue neoplasm, few things you should never forget. We are just going to read the few things. And I think uh, the next year after this, your mixoid liposarcoma came in MCQ, fine. So Ewing sarcoma, my translocation will be translocation 1122. Ewing sarcoma has been changed a lot. I'm sure you guys know what all the changes happen. Recently, I cannot call Ewing sarcoma as Ewing sarcoma. It is a small round undifferentiated tumor, that's all. The latest name of Ewing's is small round undifferentiated tumor. They don't even want to call the term Ewing's. I have to say it's small round undifferentiated tumor and do a molecular analysis to say what group. There are four different groups of Ewing, uh, small round undifferentiated tumor. Maybe whenever time permits, we'll discuss about them as well. We have few mutations called a CAC2 and BCOR1 mutations, which are new ones, fairly new ones, may not be required for an undergraduate much, but we'll read it sometimes later so that we'll cover them as well, or I'll put in the form of an MCQ later on, fine. Okay, so we'll see a few other soft tissue new, um, translocations which are required for us. CD99 Shasti, we'll ignore it for now because CD99 is a very, very old marker, right? We have much many many new marker for Ewings. Uh, in the pre in the special class also we discuss NKX 2.2. It's very very important, right? And the most important one for us is Fly One. Right? Fly One is Fly One also came in one of the exams in Jibma. This also been superseded by my NKX marker. Right? Translocation 922. Where do you see? Where will you see translocation 922? Classical CML, isn't it? Translocation 15, 14. You see in classical APML, acute promyelocytic leukemia. Okay, fine. Where do we see translocation 25? This is also seen in one of the lymphomas. Which lymphomas? Translocation 25 is, yeah, uh, livelihood, yeah, correct. Your 922 can also be seen in ALL. Fine. Translocation 25 is seen in. ALCL, anaplastic large cell lymphoma, where you have translocation 25, other translocations which, have, which are there in the MCQ, right? So in other words, there's only one translocation which is for a soft tissue sarcoma, rest everything is for hematological uh, malignancies. Mostly genetic diagnosis for hematological malignancy only. Off late, these guys of soft tissue sarcomas also being cropping up, maybe in future, we will have a time where morphology becomes very, very insignificant and molecular will take over maybe five to 10 years down the road. Everything is going to be molecular diagnosis so that there will be very much precision and I can diagnose it to a greater accuracy. Fine. Ewing's is one, translocation 1122. Ewing's can have one more translocation as well, translocation 2122. The common denominator for both of them is your 22nd chromosome where you have your EWS gene. Ewing's uh, uh, sarcoma gene, fine. We have EWS gene, which is common denominator. In 1122, EWS gene gets translocated with, you have an EWS with Fly1, right? That's why your Fly1 becomes important. Fly1 is a marker, uh, uh, IHC marker, right? Because of this. Why Fly1 became secondary is, in the second translocation, I don't see Fly1. It's between EWS and ERG. Right? So the second translocation is between EWS and ERG. And this is the reason NKX 2.2 became more famous. NKX 2.2 became more famous for the only reason 
NKX 2.2 will be positive in the EWS and Fly1 as well as EWS and ERG. So I don't miss anything out, right? So that's the reason this is positive for both and Fly1 is implied it's going to be positive for the only one translocation, right? So NKX 2.2 is better than your uh, Fly1 IRC, okay? Next. Why is CD99 is not famous is it's positive in almost all of the Ewing sarcomas. It's positive in lymphomas. It's positive in many round cell tumors. So we generally ignore CD99. But unfortunately, if that's the only answer in your MCQ, go for that. Right? Keep it as last option. Okay. We have a few liposarcomas. Synovial sarcoma also we have to know. Synovial sarcoma also, it has a very characteristic diagnostic uh, translocation which has been asked previously as well, translocation X18, which is the X chromosome and the 18th chromosome, fine. You need not know about the gene for synovial sarcoma. It is just named synovial sarcoma 1, 2, and 3, like that. So it's uh, immaterial, we, we need not know about it, fine. Then extraskeletal mixoid chondrosarcomas. That was also asked. You know, mixoid chondrosarcoma and mixoid liposarcoma was also asked. Mixed chondrosarcoma, again I'm going to have translocation 922, okay. It's not the Philadelphia one. Here again, it's the 22nd chromosome, what it's getting involved here is your Ewing sarcoma gene only, right. Here the whatever is there in 22 in your soft tissue tumor is your Ewing sarcoma gene. With that, I'm going to have your uh, some other gene which is getting translocated, fine, right. Next, few more things. What do you think is the gene mutated in uh, mixoid liposarcoma? This was the question which came in your uh, one of the recent AIMS exam. Which gene is getting muted in mixoid liposarcoma? Fine. And if this came in the exam, I think the question was this translocation was given as a diagnostic part and a mixoid microscopy of image was given. And I think the question was what which is the following diagnosis, right? Translocation 1216, right? You guys are right. And the microscopy will be full of a mixoid background. You can, I'm sure you will be able to identify mixoid background because it's be almost clear. Maybe a faint, hazy, bluish or pinkish color like your mixoma with lipoblasts here and there. Okay. Fine. Okay. Lipoblast is the diagnostic thing for any liposarcoma. Okay. This also has come before. These are a few things which has come previously and few other things are also there. Nodular fasciitis, yes, whatever Ritwik said is correct. See, nodular fasciitis, again, I am going to keep nodular fasciitis as primarily in histopathological diagnosis. I might not require a molecular uh, testing for nodular fasciitis, right? But yes, for these things, I might require. And do remember one more thing as well, because here this, in this also, I might ask for a uh, molecular diagnostic testing. Practically, I might ask for it. Alveolar soft part sarcoma. Because alveolar soft part sarcoma is a very close differential diagnosis of granular cell tumor. So alveolar soft part sarcoma, it is X17. X18 is for synovial and X17 is for alveolar soft part sarcoma. And one more reason why I need to know here is, uh, in your renal thing, uh, when we are discussing renal tumors, uh, we discussed a new tumor which is common in your it's a renal cell carcinoma common in adolescents. What is the tumor? We have a renal cell carcinoma which is common in adolescents. XP11 translocation as a carcinoma, right? Perfect. So in that XP11 translocation as a carcinoma, I said one gene is getting involved. What gene is that? What gene is that? We have a marker also based on that. TFE3, right? You remember, I hope you remember that. The same thing gets muted here as well. Here, the X part is your TFE3. The TFE3 gets translocation with, they're translocated with ASPL gene, which is alveolar soft part uh, sarcoma gene, right? Right, so this TFE3 is also an IHC marker for your alveolar soft part sarcoma. Because there are few, quite a few neoplasms which comes under TFE3 positive neoplasms. One we have already read, the XP11 translocation as a sarcoma. Yeah, toffee gene looks good, right? Okay, maybe you make a mnemonic on that and let me know or you tell to everyone else, fine? If you let me know, I will tell to everyone else with your name, Duri Ravi Shankar, fine? 
So TFE3 gene associated neoplasms is completely and separate entity where we have read two of them. Maybe in due course we'll add few of them. Few more are there. We'll add few more so that it'll be better for us for to compile everything, right? We're just going to read everywhere, and compilation is going to happen in your mind. It's not going to happen in the form of a tabular column. Fine. Okay. So these are few soft tissue sarcomas translocations which you have to know. Okay. Next, we have got one more. Uh, match the following so look at the thing and answer one side we have a microscopy finding of uh, heart other side we have the diagnostic things we'll have a look at uh, we'll see this guy alone we'll see later we'll have a look at the other persons myocyte disarray is a classical diagnostic finding seen in hocm fine myocyte hypertrophy your boxcar nuclei see boxcar nuclei is going to be something like this when i have a cardiac cell and have a nucleus a rectangular nucleus a rectangular prominent nucleus i'm going to call it a box boxcar nucleus that's all fine that's a boxcar nucleus so boxcar nucleus is a very very non-specific finding whenever i'm going to have a myocyte cardiac myocyte getting hypertrophy i will have a boxcar nuclei fine of these causes which condition do you think will have a myocyte hypertrophy? Which of these following will have a myocyte hypertrophy? Hypertension, one of the commonest things will have myocyte hypertrophy. Am I right in saying that your uh, HOCM also will have myocyte hypertrophy? It will. Dilated cardiomyopathy will, will it have myocyte hypertrophy? Yes, it will. So, box nuclei is a bit non specific finding which is seen in the condition of myocyte hypertrophy. Commonest one being obviously hypertension right the commonest one being obviously hypertension so i'm going for that because this uh, this master following if all these recall is correct that's my first doubt this uh, this recall options both a and b are given by students if all of them are correct it's going to go in this way fine vacillation of myocytes vacillation is seen in conditions uh, where i'm going to have an ischemia right is whenever there's an ischemia you will have when, when you remember your uh, first chapter cell injury the first finding after an ischemia in case of any cell is two things. One is cellular swelling, other one is fat change, fatty change. Vacillation is something of that sort. Okay. When I have an ischemic condition, I'm definitely going to have a vacillation. So the fourth guy is again myocyte hypertrophy. This I'm not sure. Again, I'm going with your friend's recall, your senior's recall. If the recall everything is correct, I'm going to go for you. Uh, the only one option left is DCM. Fine. Hypertrophy myocyte can be seen in HOCM, can be seen in hypertension, can be seen in dilated cardiomyopathy as well. Because dilated cardiomyopathy also will have myocyte hypertrophy, fine. So, if I have to make sure, like the best answer here would be one will be for B. So, either these two, two will be for A, both having two will be A, three vacillation is for D, so answer will be option D, fine. So match the following might be easy. The only difficult thing about match the following is I might require a little bit of more time. Don't just superficially look and click and come the wrong, uh, click the wrong answer and then just repent after coming outside. Fine. Make sure you find the key point, whatever you're strong at, and try to rule out the options and come to the correct answer if it's a match the following. Hopefully this pattern will not repeat. But we do know it's not in our hands. Okay. Next one. I hope this sort of questions ever, never ever comes in your exams. But almost always like once in a year, like either in your INISET or in your NEET, previously your AIMS, PG or GYMMA, one question invariably comes on your inflammatory mediator. So inflammatory mediator, few of them are easy. Vasodilatation, histamine, that's all. I'm going to think of histamine. But few inflammatory mediators, especially when it comes to interleukins and cytokines, it becomes very difficult because it's totally in memory related question, right? When it's becoming memory related, we remember only the easier option of histamine. We'll remember interleukin 4, 5 for your eosinophils. If few new interleukin comes, we are stuck. Right? So hopefully these type of questions will stop. Let's see. If it stops, it's good for you as well as good for me. Fine. This is a straightforward question. It's going to be histamine. Right? The best answer here will be histamine. Okay. Again, this also is one straightforward question. Basophils are activated by What's the counterpart of basophil in tissue called as? 
the counterpart of the basal parent tissue is perfect is mast cells right mast cells are the counterpart of basophils in tissue fine basophils in uh, blood and mast cells in your tissue right mass the question is now it's been just i'm just going to reframe it mast cells are activated in in which condition do you see mast cell activation which condition do you see mast cell activation or mast cell degranulation the famous thing which comes to mind is your type 1 hypersensitivity okay or your asthma right that's where i'm going to see mast cell degranulation fine so if you remember your type 1 hypersensitivity or your asthma if you look at how asthma and every the etiopathogenesis i'm sure you must have seen something like this you have a mast cell this guy which will be on the top you'll have one more mast cell there'll be one more guy on the top and when this guy binds to the allergen right binds to the allergen this will start to degranulate right cross link and this will start to degranulate who is that person this person is the most important person who is ige so you have to read the question carefully most of you answered interleukin 5 so this will release interleukin 4 interleukin 5 all of them will come from that uh, the cell membranes will produce interleukin lots of lots of them this interleukin will further attract your eosinophils and others the question is activation of mast cells right activation of mast cell is by ige only activation is degranulation right when a sensitized individual gets exposed to the antigen again the ige which is already there on the top of the mast cell during sensitization that will helps in degranulation the degranulation will give you histamine will give you serotonin will give you your prostaglandins that will again attract more and more inflammation will produce the acute allergic response right the answer here is ige fixer and answer should is a il5 will not activate a mast cell maybe will it will attract a mast cell right activation is only based on your ige fixer fine okay it is not interleukin 5 okay got it i hope you got the question okay next okay. see it's totally different the as, as last paper we discussed yesterday it had more of difficult questions more of new topics see this is a very very simple question please don't make uh, errors when a question like this comes thinking that this there's some twist here okay there's no twist here easy questions do come don't overthink easy question and write it wrongly and come intrinsic pathway and extrinsic pathway is seen in apoptosis your intrinsic pathway is your mitochondrial mediated pathway extrinsic pathway is cell membrane mediated pathway fine both of them whatever it is is the initiator phase and will commonly come to an execution phase and it will die the cells will die right is a very very old one the first one which all of us read in your robbins near second year right the same old apoptosis your intrinsic and extrinsic pathway fine okay next one yeah extrinsic will be fas mediated and your mitochondrial pathway will be your uh, bcl2 and the uh, mismatch between your pro apoptotic and your anti apoptotic genes okay and this is one aims which are again lots of questions based on iron metabolism just a normal iron metabolism we'll just have a quick look about normal iron metabolism and i'm sure we can answer two or three questions based on that for normal iron metabolism iron gets absorbed in duodenum it goes inside who's the guy which helps to, to for it to go inside into the cell is my dmt1 divalent metal ion transporter one and goes inside it goes in the form of ferritin it gets stored in the form of ferritin whenever my body requires iron ferritin goes outside us with the help of ferroportin okay fine from ferroportin it's going to go to my transferrin transferrin either goes to the bone marrow or it goes to the liver for storage fine right? bone marrow for utilization maybe it goes to the liver for store for some time when in the liver i have a molecule called as hepcidin which is secreted hepcidin is like a master regulator what hepcidin does is hepcidin has a negative role on transferrin i have purposefully skipped a few things i have purposely skipped skipped your duodenal cytochrome hepcidin all of them i have skipped just for a quick recap of your iron metabolism right this is a quick recap of iron metabolism right and whenever i lose this uh, 
mucosal ion it just goes away when the epithelium is gone my stored form of ferritin is also gone along with that that's one of the ways iron is being lost from the body apart from your menstrual bleeding in women fine right so hepcidin inhibits which of the following is the question here hepcidin inhibits ferroportin yes hepcidin is an acute phase reactant as well fine so hepcidin whenever it's elevated it reduces ferroportin when it reduces ferroportin it doesn't make let the iron come outside Hepcidin is an acute phase reactant only because of this function. If in during an acute phase reactant, let's assume it's a bacterial infection. When I'm having a bacterial infection, my body has to make sure the bacteria dies. That's the reason my body increases the body temperature, fever. Fever is a protective mechanism, so the bacteria will die. So by this method, it's not letting iron come outside. When iron is reduced in the serum or in the blood, again bacteria cannot divide. Iron is very essential for me. Iron is very essential for my bacteria as well. So bacterial division is reduced. So it's again a protective mechanism, an acute phase reactant, right? That's why hepcidin is an acute phase reactant. So hepcidin acts by inhibiting ferroportin. That's your first question. The second question, which is based on the same similar premise, is this: Iron uptake inside an enterocyte is taken care of by who? Inside the enterocyte is the one person, which is going to be your DMT1, right? Divalent metal ion transporter one helps in the movement of iron from outside to inside your duodenal cell, which is an enterocyte. Fine. Okay, there are two questions based on that. There's one more question based on that. I uh, will not go into it now. Fine. You have a question of the ferritin RNA. Only once it came, it will not get repeated. That was a question based on a uh, study published by Ames. So random one-off question. You need not know and understand the reasoning for that. Memorize the option. If it comes again, write the option. That's all. Okay. Next. Okay. This was a googly question of that year. Flow cytometry. See, flow cytometry is one of the easiest one. If you know, uh, it's a very basic principle. I hope all of you guys know. If you don't know, maybe we'll discuss sometimes later. It's a very very simple one. The question is given. A and B are normal scatter plots. I'll just zoom the image. For B cells, B lymphocytes. Images C and D are the patient's scatter plot. Fine. A, B, C, D. A and B are normal scatter plots. I am not going to interpret on this. This is side scatter. I am going to interpret on this guy only. I am not going to interpret on this again because this is side scatter. Side scatter, forward scatter, use, useful for a function called as gating. I am not going to interpret on this. So my interpretation is going to be on B and D scatter plots only. Fine. When it comes to scatter plot, this is my person in question because that's also given in this. First clue. It's been marked in the first A thing as the red dot stands for B cells. Fine. Right? Red dot stands for B cells. Okay. So when I when I'm going to look at the B option, this is the red dot. See here it is going to be dual positivity. It's a simple interpretation of graph which you must have read in your sixth standard. Right. A sixth standard person can interpret flow cytometry. We have we have crossed that age long back. We will be definitely able to write write a flow cytometry. Right. So which means it's positive here as well as positive here. But when I look at this, this is the patient, right? This was put as normal as the patient. Here, I'm going to have positivity here. And when I look at this, the y-axis, it is negative. And y-axis, you can see that this is CD40 negative. So which means this B cell in the patient is not having CD40. If the patient is not having CD40, or in other words, mutation in CD40. Mutation in CD40 or CD40 ligand. What is the use of CD40 and CD40 ligand? We will go to the normal physiology first. CD40, CD40 ligand interaction is very, very essential for one function. What function is that? It's very, very essential for class switching, right? It switches from one class of immunoglobulin to another class of immunoglobulin, right? This is very, very important for class switching. What's the first immunoglobulin to be produced? The first immunoglobulin to be produced is IgM. So if after that only IgM is changed to IgE or IgG or what or IgA, whatever it is. So if this is not there, class switching is not there, every immunoglobulin produced will stay at IgM and they'll produce only IgM always. So the answer is going to be a hyper IgM syndrome, right? This very, very simple thing to diagnose. The only thing is required for us is normal. You know normal, abnormality, you are going to decide it, fine. So it's just going to be in hyper IgM syndrome. Okay, got it. Fine. 
this see every now and then this something new will come that something new you will get stumped ignore that leave the question go on to the next question new questions are fine you might make make mistakes you cannot get 100% if you get 100% in an entrance exam you are definitely having some problem you are abnormal fine don't worry about getting 100% always okay the next one it's again straight forward uh, fact factual based question which of the following produces von willebrand factor the major producer of von willebrand factors endothelial cells endothelial cells is where they are stored von willebrand factor stored in endothelial cells in inside which is there any particular name in which von willebrand factor stored is there any particular thing inside which von willebrand factor stored if you guys know we have something called as perfect we have weibel palate bodies in weibel palate bodies we have von willebrand factor and we have one more guy as well what the other guy we have p selectin as well right so we have p selectin as well as your von willebrand factor these will be stored inside the endothelial cells in the form of tiny forms of weibel palate bodies okay so again a straight forward mcq is a theoretical based question next one we will call it a day with this question this question is based on your uh, proto oncogene transformation what you have to learn is you have to know only one thing proto oncogene when will they cause cancer when they won't have a gain of function or loss of function mutation yes himanshu is correct macrocytes and livers are also other source of von willebrand factor proto oncogene i am going to have gain of function mutation right i am going to have gain of function mutation the question asking is which of the following things can cause a gain of function mutation that's all few things which are straight forward can amplification increase the function of a uh, gene yes for sure and i'm going to have promoter or enhancer an insertion means some, some mutation in promoter and en enhancer the promoter becomes more prominent i will have gain of function enhancer becomes more prominent i will have gain of function right i'll have gain of function for sure uh so the last one left is point mutation see i have to arrive to this question logically i'm sure all of you will know the answer for sure this three is straight forward will cause gain of function mutation i need to know one at least one example for point mutation hello dexois i need to know one example for point mutation to say it's in gain of function mutation we'll go back to our uh, mutations which we know i'm sure you'll know the gene which is mutated in polycythemia vera what is the gene what's the gene mutated in polycythemia vera it is jack2 right and also i'm sure you must know the mutation uh, gene mutated in melanoma what's the gene mutated in melanoma melanoma the gene mutated is braf right both are proto oncogenes if you remember i'm just taking two examples so that we understand point mutation can also cause oncogene proto oncogene to oncogene transformation if you remember we used right v617f okay uh have you what ajay okay and the other one is going to be your braf we have something called as v600e so what are this two v600f and v600e they are actually a point mutation at one mutation i am having one transformation of one amino acid to the other that's a point mutation so i can easily say that i am not taking exon 12 here that's not a point mutation right i can easily take this and i can extrapolate that yes point mutation can also cause an transformation to your uh, proton oncogene to oncogene fine so this also will be the answer so answer is going to be all of them will be correct fine so these three i can easily know from the name itself point mutation also we can extrapolate from whatever already information we have and we just have to think about it you will definitely get the right answer fine okay got it we just one more thing the last question scid which of the following is not a cause of scid scid is your severe combined immunodeficiency okay severe combined immunodeficiency no one thing for me sure is this uh, we know already two common things in scid 
your uh, gamma gene of interleukin receptor that's the common one in SAD which we already know which of the following is not a cause here so read all the four options ZAP70 we know in one place of CLL I'm not sure whether it will cause SAD interleukin 2 receptor yes it will cause SAD JAK3 yes it will cause SAD your autosomal recessive forms of SAD right and adenos in DMNAs also will cause BTK what is BTK Bruton's tyrosine kinase right Bruton's tyrosine kinase will cause Bruton's A gamma globulinemia not SCAD so I am safe in marking this I am not sure about ZAP70 if it will cause or not it will cause as well there are multiple autosomal recessive SCADs X-link is one your interleukin uh, 2 receptor there are multiple auto, uh, your adenosine DMNA is an autosomal recessive SCAD ZAP70, JAK3 everything are autosomal recessive SCADs fine RAG as well right? RAG2, RAG as well so this is Bruton's, so this, this is the odd one out, so definitely you can write the correct answer. You need not know everything about SCAD to answer this question. If you know Bruton's tyrosine kinase, that I am sure all of you guys know, you can easily mark the answer and come out, fine. Bubble baby syndrome, yeah, it's a good name. Fine. Okay. These are the questions which came in your number aims 19 I suppose. Tomorrow we'll discuss one more set of questions which came in other AIMS exam. If you have anything uh, specific to discuss, let me know. Okay. Maybe after this we'll try to pick up Jimba questions uh, or your PGI questions. Fine. Okay. Thank you guys. Good night. Ajay, enjoy your birthday. I hope all the wishes of this year yours comes true. And please wish for an early NEET exam. So that's something you wish on the birthday will help others as well, right? Not early, at least by September, whatever they have proposed, it should come back, fine? Thank you for your time. Bye-bye.